Welcome to Season 4 of The Great Humbling. My name's Ed Gillespie, and I'm a futurist, a poet, and a recovering sustainability consultant. In the spring of 2020, during the first lockdown, I began recording a series of conversations with Dougal Hine, co-founder of a school called Home. We started with a question. What if it makes sense to think of ourselves as living in a time of humbling, being laid low, brought down to earth. Pulling on that thread has taken us further and become more central to our work than either of us expected. So we're back now with an open-ended series as part of the wider patchwork of homewardbound.org. Thank you for listening. All right, here we are. It's another year. It's 2023. It's the eighth episode of season four of The Great Humbling. Time to draw this season to a close. And we did, Ed, we did three series of eight episodes each in our first year and a half. We've done one series of the same number of episodes in our second year and a half. What happened? <laughs> well, um, I think we've observed this before, but you can't rush your humbling. You know, when it comes is the right time. But yes, yeah. we should be a, we should be about to be a little bit more conscious of our of our rhythm. We are where we are. We're gonna well, we're gonna take a little break after this episode before season five and work out what format and tempo makes sense next. But we do have a special invitation for any listeners who are within reach of. Norwich, Ed's part of the world, on the 20th of February 2023, we are going to be recording a live episode of The Great Humbling. It's going to be a very special episode because after four series where it's just the two of us talking to each other, we're going to have guests. We're going to have the um, amazing philosopher, Green Party, climate activist and general man of many talents, Rupert Reed. And we're going to have Charlotte Ducan, who came to the second ever Dark Mountain Festival to write about it for The Independent and ended up getting sucked so far in that she's now co-director of the Dark <laughs> Mountain Project. And the four of us are going to be in conversation at Norwich Arts Centre on the 20th of February, which is part of this whole At Work in the Ruins tour that I'm going to be doing in February around the UK and beyond. Mm. So come down and join us if you can. And if you can't, then that will be recorded and released as a one-off episode during the gap between season four and five. We're promising a conversation that goes to the parts of climate change discussion that other conversations can't reach. So I reckon we can make good on that promise, Ed. Yeah. How are you feeling as we reach the end of this series? Um, it's, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's funny to be concluding, uh, a series at the start of the year. <laughs> it's like, uh, that feels sort of slightly contradictory and paradoxical in itself, but, um, I- I've got a strange mix of emotions. Um, obviously there is always a degree of introspection and analysis when you turn a new year. Um, but yeah, I'm in, I- I'm in a, a good place personally. Um, and, I feel like we are getting into the stage where there are all sorts of uh, interesting fungal conversations starting to grow in those dark forests. I think, to paraphrase our mutual friend Brian Eno, he said, you know, change comes at two moments. One, when people realise that everything needs to change. And the second phase is when they realise that everyone else realises that things need to change. Um, and I, I, I get a sense that we're emerging into one of those sort of moments. Nicely put. Yeah, it's all getting a bit fungal, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let's start with our traditional question. What have we been reading or listening to or watching or, or imbibing or whatever <laughs> that has been making us think? How about you, Ed? Uh, well, I um, I read this book called At Work in the Ruins. Um, I don't know. Oh, why, yeah, I heard um, about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt it would be churlish not to. Um, no, I would say I've I've really enjoyed your book. It's 
lovely to read a book where someone you know very well uh, as the author because you hear the voice in your head and your heart in a very different way i suspect um and you know i think it's fair to say you're actually even more erudite on paper which is quite saying something um but that's the joy of a good editor isn't it <laughs> which which these conversations um perhaps uh could always benefit from um but you must be feeling you must be feeling that weird sensation that all writers get when they've gone public with their efforts uh, and are, are having all sorts of odd and inspiring encounters. I was I was thinking about this last night because actually the the physical copies of the actual book arrived in the post yesterday. So for the first time, I'm holding it in my hand Ooh. as an object that's not the sort of the proofs or anything else. But this is the thing that is going out into the world. And I was remembering Gordon White talking about how with every book he's done, he always has this moment the night before of the night before publication of feeling it's all shit. Like I've written a <laughs> load, of, load of crap and that that's just part of the journey. And I realized that I feel like I kind of went through that early. Like I definitely had a while after finishing the final draft of feeling like that. And then at a certain point in the autumn, I started to get these responses in from people who had read it, who were not like friends who were kind of duty bound to say nice things, but people I hardly knew or didn't know at all, but whose work I really respect. And when they started saying things about it it suddenly i had to stop i had i had to just shut down the part of me that was secretly going it's all crap <laughs> well you've you've published so now you are damned <laughs> it, but it has been getting pretty weird i mean i did this thing the other day filming with vandana shiva in stockholm which we'll talk about later actually and and we're there waiting at vandana's hotel and greta tumbai just <laughs> drops by on her way home from school to see Vandana and Vandana had gone round the corner to a cafe and no one knew which cafe she was in. So it's me and my editor <laughs> and Minakshi, this lovely woman who was volunteering with us. And Greta sat for about 10 minutes in the lobby of this hotel. And I sat there and afterwards I was like, we sat there for 10 minutes. Oh, we didn't talk about climate change. We talked about language and like the differences between Swedish and English. And we were kind of joking around. And now afterwards I was like, well, the book was originally going to be called Why I'm No Longer Talking to People About Climate Change. <laughs> so maybe I'm making good on that promise. There's something wonderful about that, though, isn't it? That you did actually talk about something different. Um, I, I often find when you when you meet someone who, of renown and fame, the last thing you want to talk about is the obvious thing. Because you just you feel know, like, like everyone has that conversation with them. And yeah, what am exactly. I possibly going to say apart from just keep going, like keep doing what you're yeah. doing? That's basically all I had to say. <laughs> obviously i'm hoping that lots of people will be reading or listening to at work in the ruins and coming to the events in the uk and germany in february but but ed i'm guessing knowing you you've been doing some other reading as well tell us about it i would i mean, just to compare and contrast i mean you know I, I wouldn't say your book was was work but it is um related to the work um but i actually juxtaposed that with i've just coming to the conclusion of the five part dark is rising series you know the susan cooper book which i don't think i'd read since i was a teenager i don't think i read the whole series when i was a teenager so um yes it's a sort of children's book but there's something um still magical about it which has been tapping into all sorts of sort of alan garner uh, type resonances which we we've touched on before so I, i've really enjoyed that and then i watched i re-watched something also that i hadn't seen for 20 years um which is songs from the second floor that swedish film which is is quite quite brilliant um and it, you know when you go back to something two decades later and you see it in a very different way um and in hindsight there was there's all sorts of prophetic components in that film which which when you rewatch become much more starkly illuminated than the first time I saw them. I was obviously a different person. I was, you know, 30. It was the early years of Futera and my sort of sustainability career. Um, and I remember thinking, whoa, what a bleak film and bleakly funny. Um, and it's, you know, two decades on, uh, it has a different weight. Um, so I thoroughly recommend if people haven't watched that, Songs from the Second Floor. 
Yeah, it's Roy Anderson, isn't it? The, yeah, the great yeah. Swedish director. I I want to go back and rewatch that because I watched it first when I had just moved to Sweden and um, before I learned <laughs> Swedish and I I must actually go back and watch it without needing the subtitles. Yes. And see how it looks now. I mean, there's, other, there's, there's just one scene in it that always sticks to me where, um, you know, the central character is is on a an underground a metro train you know and the all the other passengers just spontaneously burst into song it's like this choral moment on the on the train and you know you never catch an underground train afterwards in the same way without sort of glancing around and going what would it feel like if everyone here just simultaneously launched into song (laughs) (laughs) Uh, what have you been reading well i'm just midway through at the moment a book that takes me back to lots of things we've talked about over these four series which is Gabor Mate's The Myth Mm. of Normal Mm. and obviously lots of people know Gabor Mate for his writing about trauma about ADHD about addiction Um, but this feels like the book where he's really laying it all on the line and making his big argument which is that you know we the, the medicine has been so trapped inside the body side of the mind-body distinction um, that it's got essentially kind of a false story of disease that is no longer in line with the latest research because there's this (coughs) gap of how long it takes before that's taught in medical school and then how long it gets out into practice. So he's really talking about, you know, both at a personal level, how diseases are so bound up with the stories of our lives and our experiences, mm-hmm. even even physical diseases. There's so much evidence for this. And then secondly, at a societal level, it's really, you know, it's a book that is drawing on the, the work of science to tell a fairly damning story about modernity. You know, you mm-hmm. can really put it alongside hospicing modernity and alongside the argument that I'm making in at work in the ruins and it adds from quite an authoritative relatively insider kind of place some really helpful information to this picture of there just being something weird and counterproductive about the ways of living that pass for normal Mm. around here Mm. that are making us Mm. sick as individuals and as societies so Mm. really a really strong book and that was I, i should say that recommendation came to me from Kelly Lee Hickey, an Australian artist who we work with in a school called Home, and she she spoke about it and said, I feel like this is a book that's going to resonate with things that you talk about, Dougal, and she was absolutely right. I'm just mentally adding it to my Sundoku pile. Yeah. So we're going to talk about another book in this episode, aren't we, Ed? Yes. (laughs) Because it brings into focus a theme that we've been talking about all series and in the previous series... I mean, I've said quite a bit previously about Chris Smage's book, Small Farm Future. Mm. Today, we want to start from another book that also tells a story about the future of farming, or rather the end of farming. We're going to talk about George Monbiot's Regenesis. Yes. So um, it's no accident that we're recording this on Burns Night, um, the 25th of January. Uh, where we usually celebrate the great Scottish poet uh, and raconteur, uh, Robert Burns. Um, and I've I've read both Chris Mage's Small Farm Future um, and Regenesis. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, I came at it the other way round. I read Regenesis first, um, and then I was sort of a little bit sort of seduced by it let's say or found myself in a sort of puzzled moment and and shared something about it um in a in a whatsapp group i'm in uh and then a friend recommended saying well you need to read chris smage um which i knew you had talked about so i've diligently gone off and read both but i think it's apt that um burns famously said there is no such uncertainty as a sure thing. Hmm. Um, and we'll get into unpicking the meaning of that, of that line, but I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, the, uh, the American author, Lionel Shriver, um, Dougald, we need to talk about George. Yeah, I can feel a certain tension in my body as you say that, Ed, um, we'll kind of yeah. 
come back around to some some stories that are worth sharing as context for all of this. But I think the best way to go into this is to start with the book itself. And so, yeah, I know that you've been reading Regenesis lately, and I think we can count on you to give us a fair summary, maybe starting with its strengths as a book. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've pretty much read everything George has ever written. You know, I enjoyed rewilding, you know, um, um, you know, how everything is broken and however we could fix it, you know, all, I mean, you know, and some of those things do chime um, with us. And what's, what's beautiful about Regenesis, I mean, he starts off with this whole poetry of the soil, which is very similar to Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life, you know, exploration of, of fungi. Um, but, you know, George takes us down this wonderful rabbit hole about the microcosm um, underneath her feet and all the abundance and diversity. You know, the fact that there's whole new phyla of animals that are, are there underneath the soles of our feet um, that we're not even aware of. And he makes a lovely comparison to the Serengeti saying, in all my adventures internationally, you know, I've actually not seen as much diversity of wildlife as actually been looking at a spoonful of soil from my, uh, my orchard um and and then he takes us in that in in a in a very clever way into the fact that you know there is all of this intricate secret garden going on that you know almost uh, a third of the photosynthesized sugars that are created by all our plants are actually actively pumped into the rhizosphere around their roots uh, and there's this extraordinary gifting and reciprocity going on with all the bacteria and the fungi and the nematodes and the worms. Um, again, very, very sheldrake. Uh, and I'm sure George is probably taking a little bit of inspiration from Merlin. I don't think it'd be unfair to say, but it's a really beautiful poetry of the soil. Um, and then you get some very robust, you know, classic Monbio articulation of, you know, the perversity of the global standard diet and the global standard farm relationship where these two things reinforce each other um, uh, in a sort of, you know, nightmarish unfolding um, towards a convergence uh, of, a, 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 you know, an internationally standardised diet and farming system. But w- what struck me there, which I don't think we can argue with, um, was... You know, there was some very clever stuff around how the number of global calories produced um, per person per day or available to people um, per day has increased dramatically. You know, it's more than doubled in the last 50 years, but most of that has been fed to animals. Uh, with all the kind of consequences that we know about um, water scarcity, you know, overheating, the systemic resilience of our soils and the corporate capture of the very elements of the food chain. Um and, and then another compelling argument around agricultural sprawl, where he explores in particular, you know, the, the horrors of, of chicken farms um, in the Wye Valley uh, and all of that intensive farming impacts on the local ecology there and the eutrophication uh, of the river. Um, the impacts like I see around my local neighbourhood here in Norfolk, where they're barely seems to be any actual food being grown um because so much of it is for energy crops which are going to anaerobic biodigestion or you know into animal feed and and then and then george you know inevitably talks about sheep um and if you've read any of his previous work you will know how much george monbio hates sheep he really really (laughs) hates sheep (laughs) I mean, you know, he said sheep farming has caused more ecological destruction in the UK than every building ever built. You know, he's described them as a slow burning ecological disaster or a white plague uh, or perhaps more colourfully. Britain is being shagged by sheep and hardly anyone dares say so. Um, Now, there's probably also uh, an element of truth in some of that, but there is quite a lot of um, visceral language uh, around our poor ovine friends um and george actually he blames theocritus you know as we all do i mean you know lord knows i've blamed theocritus um but for establishing this sort of third century pastoral tradition for the virtue and romanticization of shepherding so 
so there's some really interesting stuff. I just wanted to set that scene, you know, the poetry of the soil, the articulation of some of these, you know, standardised perversions of both farm and, and, and the sprawl of agriculture. Um, but then he starts to get into the knotty bits, you know, and he sort of says, actually, whilst NEP, you know, with big rewilding project down south of London, is great you know if we adopted that nationwide in the uk we we could all expect to enjoy you know one decent steak every three years uh, and where it gets uncomfortable is george just then takes aim it seems to take aim at everything <laughs> it's like a sort of uh it's not a scattergun but it is it's like localism seasonality efficiency you know alan savory's rotational grazing mechanisms food waste urban food pretty much anyone and everything ends up ends up in the line of fire with one sort of minor exception of uh, of ian tolhurst the the regenerative farmer on the hardwick estate but he says even though what tolly is doing is is really interesting it all sounds like relentless unrewarding very hard and marginal work um and he gives a little bit of time to the idea of perennial crops rather than these kind of you know very destructive annual crop rotation cycles and and no-till or low plow systems uh, and then there's the reveal and then at the end you suddenly get to like having shot at everything you get and the solution is genetically engineered precision fermentation and you, you know it, le- it left me with a bit of a bad taste in my mouth because it can feel as though all the risks that he's just talked about corporatization intensification and standardization all equally apply to conventional agriculture and whilst he sort of acknowledges them in the context of what might be an industrial genetically engineered precision fermentation food system they somehow no longer apply so it's it's a bit like this extreme eco-modernism um which he's adopting and 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 it really reminded me you know the one time i've spent time with george in person you know and this is not meant as a as a personal attack on him at all um was when he'd just gone public um about his advocacy for nuclear power you know i was actually staying at his house and i remember having this very weird conversation over breakfast about what he was doing um uh, and at the same time george is also saying you know in this almost in the same breath our survival depends on disobedience and the very last thing i think you know genetically engineered precision fermentation uh, of of proteins is going to be is about disobedience (laughs) that seems to me about the most uh extreme co-opting um and supplication of our food uh to the system all right thanks ed i think that's really helpful to just get a bit of a picture of the arc of the book and the different elements that are being assembled Mm. into this argument So I think at this point it might be worth stepping back a little and just placing this in the context of the role that George Monbiot has played over time. And I know that our listeners are pretty international. You know, there's people in New Zealand or North America or across Europe listening to this. And so, you know, if you've been in the UK and you've been in any way involved with any of the kinds of issues that we often talk about in these podcasts, then... George's presence has been unavoidable, and perhaps that's slightly less so internationally, although I know that his books are translated and read in many parts of the world. Mm. Now, you've stayed at George's house, Ed. I've only really ever had one conversation with him, and that was on stage in front of a packed hall in Clangotlan in Wales in 2010 at the first Dark Mountain Festival. But I remember the first time I saw him, it was outside Campsfield Detention Centre in Oxford in 1998 at a protest that we were both at. And already then he was established as this, you know, this very sort of strong figure who mm. his presence prominent within so many movements over decades on the right side of so many arguments has been really important to lots of us. And... Uh, In particular, he's played this more or less unique role as a kind of one-man human interface between Mm. the environmental movement and the wider, as he used to say, movement of movements that it's part of, and the mainstream media in the UK. Because for whatever it is, it must be 30 years, he's been writing week in, week Mm. out for The Guardian. He's been that 
you know, if you're being unfair, you could say token voice, but that's not fair because it's such a strong voice. He's been the voice of these movements in the kind of, admittedly, the left liberal end of it, but nonetheless, Mm. the mainstream media in front of hundreds of thousands and millions of readers and viewers. Mm. Well, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, like, throughout my professional career, he has been the person I've always read. You know, I've you know he's been a huge inspiration and, and challenge and provocation to me um, over the decades. And I think that's sort of why it made sense to to talk about this book in the way that we're doing in this episode. You know, because to start with, like, what does it take to play that role as the human mm. interface between environmentalism <laughs> and mainstream public debate in the UK, where mainstream public debate is pretty toxic a lot of the time, mm. and where. Mm you know, it will very happily just not talk about any of the things that George and you and I would want us to be talking about. So for one thing, I think it takes the hide of a rhino. Like you have to be (laughs) so thick skinned, so able to both be aggressive and take aggression in front of audiences, in front of the public. And I think that's part of it who George is and what he has had to be in order to play this role, which I'm really glad he's been playing because I wouldn't have wanted to. No, the the personal resilience is, is extraordinary. Well, yeah. And it takes a particular set of skills as well to, you know, to play the game that British tub- public debate is based on, which is a game that is learnt in expensive schools, mostly by mm. men and mm. you know, carried out on, you know, as a sort of, uh, unarmed combat in front of um, audiences daily, day in, day out. And, you know, as I say, like my one place where I really kind of brushed up against this was as a result of when Paul and I wrote the Dark Mountain Manifesto. And George you know, did us a favour by debating Paul in the pages of The Guardian, which was how people heard of Dark Mountain in the first place. And that was the first time, really, they had ever publicly disagreed. Now, in a sense, Paul had been, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, he'd been a bit like George Monbiot's understudy. He'd been the sort of the next best known environmental journalist in Britain through the noughties, you know, a number of years younger than George. I believe they actually shared an allotment together. They had a kind of uh, an orchard on an allotment in Oxford together, you know, so... They had a relationship. I was an outsider to all of this. Um, but they they had this kind of argument which was framed around, you know, is it time to give up on trying to save industrial society or something like that? It wasn't necessarily mm. the most helpful framing, but it was part of the way that the things we were trying to learn how to say when we wrote the manifesto landed in the world and entered into public debate. And it was... It was a strange kind of favour because you know, what happened was, in his inimitable way, George made this kind of had this polemical back and forth in this series of emails that were published in the Guardian, and he said things like, "If people listen to you, billions will die," which is a polemical claim that was thrown back at us for years afterwards mm-hmm. as if it were a statement of mm-hmm. fact, and that's one of the things that we're dealing with here is this kind of blurred line between polemic and fact. And as we were preparing for the first Dark Mountain Festival in 2010, so a year after the manifesto had come out, we had been invited to use this venue in Wales and to run a sort of three-day event. And George had offered to come and engage with us live on the main stage, obviously a kind of big name speaker. And I remember the meeting where we took the decision that rather than Paul reprising this head to head with him i would be the one who went on stage with george and the intention when we took that decision was to try and steer away from this combative and frankly slightly oedipal (laughs) dynamic between the two of them you know there was a bit of a kind of the the son challenging the authority of the father thing to what was going Mm. on between paul and george i would say at that point i think sharing allotments can do that to people (laughs) Well, and so, you know, um, I put my hand up and said, yeah, no, I'd like to have a go at doing this. And obviously, you know, I was 
I was 30. I was, we just launched Dark Mountain. I was kind of stepping out and finding my voice publicly for the first time. And there was a bit of ego probably in that going, yeah, I want to take this high profile slot alongside George on stage. And I then kind of made a bit of a prat of myself because having entered into it with this internal conversation about, well, let's try and steer it away from being combative. I then made this video where I said, yeah, I'm going to be grilling George Monbiot on whether it's time for the environmental movement to stop pretending and wrote the program notes for the event in the same kind of tone. So George arrived really kind of revved up for this. And as we're about to go on stage, I say to him, George, I'd really like it if we could make this a conversation rather than a debate. And he turns around and says, ah, chickening out, are you? (laughs) If I could have my time again, what I would do is just go out on stage and just tell the audience the conversation that we just had as we were about to go on stage. How did it pan out then? How it panned out? Well, he had shown up with this whole kind of prepared riff based on me having said that I was going to be grilling him, that was all about how he was coming to be grilled and eaten by the uncivilised cannibals. <laughs> uh, and then we, we, we had this kind of really combative, or like, actually, I say really combative, it felt like kind of him throwing punches and me kind of just letting it land and trying to stay calm and just be with it. But mm. it was not a pleasant or comfortable or fruitful mm. experience. And I remember coming off that stage and bless him, Alistair McIntosh was coming on after us and he grabbed my hand and said, Dougal, you've given me a lot to work with and then proceeded to do his magic and just lift the whole room into a different state of mind and state of being and took us beyond where we were stuck in this kind of pugilistic mode that George was kind Mm. of framing things in. But I remember walking away from that and going, I'm not good at that thing that mode of engagement. I don't particularly want to get good at it because I think it's fairly limited in terms of what actually happens in the world as a result of, you know, frankly, high status white men or people who've learned how to behave in that way, going for each other for three minutes on the Today programme. It's, I, I don't want to get good at that. Mm. And at the same time, I was like, and I don't want to not be able to have a public voice because that's not how I want to show up. And so mm. that then became part of my... My work in the months and years afterwards was to try and find another way of showing up as a public voice. I'm going to edit the uh, the program notes for the February the 20th event, where um, I think it did originally say grilling Dougald Hine on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I, but I hear you. I hear you with that frustration. And I think I, I think that's the essence of what comes through in Regenesis. It's like it is this very rigorously constructed and you know a vastly researched polemic um you know as we're fond of doing you know when we go back to the etymology of polemic it actually comes from the ancient greek polemos for war you know which is actually someone who engages in warlike and hostile debates now that can be very powerful particularly when it's used satirically you know to great effect like you know jonathan swift's a modest proposal you know or or a lot of george orwell's writing although it's interesting i don't think history is full of famous female polemicists so it is actually as you were saying it's a very blokey thing to do to go at it with these sort of warlike um uh, uh, approaches of argument and that and that can feel very propagandaish i mean We've recently had another, um, well, a recurrent shitstorm uh, around Mr. Jeremy Clarkson in the UK, who's written um, another, you know, like offensive uh, column yet again. You know, these seems things that seems to come around with increasing um, regularity. And as as the comedian Stuart Lee famously observed, he goes, Jeremy Clarkson, you know, has opinions for money. Um, because they're provocative and people read them uh, and he gets paid very handsomely for them but you know they are opinions and you know you can make the same argument and I've enjoyed watching a lot of Adam Curtis's work um, but you have to take some of that with a pinch of salt although I think his latest one which is literally um, allowing 
the the subjects in the film to speak for themselves rather than him imposing his own distinctive personal narrative over the top you know my future not uh, collaborator mark stevenson absolutely hates adam curtis so we've had some um colorful discussions about you know whether they are just propaganda um almost in a goebbels style i'm not calling adam curtis goebbels but you know there is i think that. you just did ed <laughs> <laughs> like I say, did, he, I, did I, I also hear you say that George Monbiot is the Jeremy Clarkson of the Green Movement? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but you understand. I mean, but you understand the tension that I think we're trying to articulate here. It's like I'm not saying George has opinions for money um, and is engaged in in propaganda, but there is this rigidity to the polemic where you can feel like you've been um, slightly hoodwinked into a concluding position that you're not entirely comfortable with because of the way uh, that he's constructed his argument. So I want to say my impression is that George believes he is playing it straight. Yeah. I, I don't think that, uh, you know, as you say, I don't think that it would be fair to kind of make the... Uh, to seriously make the analogy with so many of the other people who are writing columns mm-hmm. in the British media. I think he's always stood yeah. out and, you know, he's always published the footnoted versions of the columns on his website with the references to scientific mm-hmm. papers yeah. and so on, which is in itself a statement about uh, the desire to hold himself to a different standard to the other people playing roles that might look similar within the British media. Mm. I guess one way that I've found myself thinking about this is through the lens of Ian McGilchrist's work and I read this autumn his book The Master and His Emissary which is an extraordinary piece of work Mm. about the two sides of the human brain and he's kind of bringing together neuroscience with philosophy to um, give us this picture of how the two sides of the brain are engaged in creating worlds and we inhabit the worlds that are created by them but they create utterly different worlds And in his story, modernity is the result of this dominance of the left brain, the part that models the world as if it's a machine, an atomized thing made out of that which we can measure and Mm. construct artificial versions of. And that side of the brain is meant to act in service to the knowing and experiencing uh, right side of the brain but what we have instead is that that has become that's trying to do all the work of knowing the world and mm. I actually yeah, I read this after I'd finished writing my book and was so struck by the uh, how closely the argument that McGilchrist is making from a very different background of research is to the argument that I'm making about you know this recurring pattern of asking too much of science in a way that yeah. is actually not doing any favours to those who do the work of science. So my impression is that George is playing it straight, but he's viewing the world through the left brain as if the world is a problem to be solved by representing Mm. it all on a spreadsheet. And uh, as you say, it's not just deeply researched, it's also carefully constructed. And this takes me back to a conversation I had that day in Tlangothlin. When I came off stage, I remember talking to the Irish thinker, Anthony McCann. And he said, you know, what struck me listening to George speak was how difficult it is to get inside the argument that you're being offered. And he said, it reminds me of Ikea. And he's come (laughs) back to this. He talks about conceptual Ikeas, that there are books that work like Ikea. You know how when you, you go through the doors of Ikea... And there's no paths, there's no crossroads, there's no forks in the road. There's just a single route yep. that you have to follow <laughs> through the whole thing. And when you engage with somebody who has the skills that George has, or, you know, for that matter, Adam Curtis has, of making these very carefully constructed arguments, you have to attend so carefully mm. to the threshold, the entrance point to that argument, because it will include premises that can be questioned. But once you've crossed that threshold, you're inside this logic that feels almost unquestionable. And that's how it can feel Mm. at times to read these kinds of books that are written both polemically and with a very fierce appeal to the authority of facts, because the premises have been kind of buried in the outset often. Mm. Yeah, and I I say that that very much um strikes a chord with me because as i say i think i was partly seduced by you know 
George talking about the poetry of the soil and talking about him tending his Oxford allotment and there's a and and the colourful stories around you know Ian Tolhurst. It's like all of that is stuff that really chimed in my heart. But I know what you mean about the conceptual IKEA, you know, and and you, you know we've all wandered around that single pathway through IKEA just trying to get to the marketplace because all you want to buy is a candle uh, <laughs> but you have to go around the whole thing i thought interestingly you, you, you might remember this story but um you know people were actually getting into trouble for having illicit sleepovers in ikea <laughs> so the the challenge would be that you would hide in the store at closing time in order to be able to sleep um in a bed uh, in one of the kind of set bedroom setups and if you like that was that's the kind of the the occupying of those conceptual ikeas it's like how do you how do you how do you make your own bed uh in the story of that narrative that's unfolding uh although ikea then co-opted all of this naughtiness and it then becomes like the kind of the triumph of their experiential marketing so you can now enter competitions to go and spend a night in ikea <laughs> now if that is not uh, a reinforcement of your um very powerful conceptual ikea or anthony mccann's very powerful uh conceptual ikea metaphor i don't know what is but i mean f- for me what george seems to be experiencing and i'm going to really empathize with him here is that feeling of desperation i think you know i think that's what led him to his previous position on nuclear um on, on desperately trying to find with good intentions um a, a viable and tangible solution to the the pain and grief uh, and frustration he was seeing um but i do believe you know what he set up in regenesis is a is another false binary you know i'm not a fan of, of nuclear and that, then the way that energy is unfolding in the uk now certainly shows you know a very powerful you know more than 50 or 60 percent of uh, of solar and wind now in the electricity mix but it's it's that dividing of the paths that we've discussed and that you very brilliantly um, articulate which often invokes that mythology of the crossroads which i know we've touched on in a previous episode and we talked about you know the spirit of papa legba uh, and you know the blues player robert johnson and all of these these deals and bargains which are often struck um at the point of the crossroads uh, and of particular resonance here i think um you know is the story of the firebird which i first heard from um our mutual friend martin shaw and you know, he, he tells the story of the Firebird in which Ivan, the son, in pursuit of the Firebird, is in the forest um, on his horse and he becomes to a dividing of the paths and there's three signs. And the first says, uh, if you if you go left, you're going to be cold and hungry. The second says, if you go straight on, you'll survive, but your horse will die. And the third one to the right says that you will die, but your horse will survive. So it's a bit of a hobson's choice type of moment but i i I feel like you know it is about making those very informed choices which the polemic argument tends to shut down well i think perhaps uh this is one thing that we could all agree on which is that there are no easy paths ahead yeah and a number of people have taken george up on the details of his argument in regenesis or the overall case that he's making in the book and there are lots of people who are better equipped than me or you to do that job so you know we can point to simon fairley and vandana shiva and i hear a rumor that chris smage is working on a more in-depth response to regenesis which i will look forward to to reading but what i thought it might be helpful to offer is some reflections on the overall landscape here now david jornstad who's a swedish environmental journalist wrote a a response to the book where he says, you know, the positive thing here is that it provides a watershed between those who believe that the future spells food tech and turning our back on nature and those of us who believe that humanity is going to need to deepen its relationship with a living earth and learn mm. to make more respectful use of it. And I'm going to be making a similar case, actually, on the 17th of February at Dartington, where I'll be giving a talk called The Parting of the Ways, the end of climate politics as we know it and the choices that lie ahead. And indeed, as you've alluded to, this is at the heart of the argument I'm making in the book, that taking climate change seriously can now mean 
things so diametrically opposed to each other that the language of climate change itself is in danger of blinding Mm. us to these choices that we face. But to pick up on your mythology of the crossroads and that possibility of the third choice or the strangeness, the things that might not be Mm. obvious in the choices, there's a warning that I make in the opening of the book. I say, the old maps will fail us. They're less and less help in making sense of where we find ourselves and where might be worth heading. This much was true before the pandemic and has only become clearer in these years. It goes with the territory of living through the ending of a world. All I'd say is don't be too quick to adopt the new maps that are offered when the ground is still moving Mm. under our feet. That's back to our mapping lava, isn't it? It is. It's back to that image. Mm. You're right, Ed. So if this is a watershed, then I'd say let's be a little bit cautious about the labels that we're offered. For example, I gather that George has been framing things as a choice between you know, mathematics and saying you know, the argument I'm making in the book is just, it, just down to mathematics and mysticism, where he's on the side of the numbers and folks like Paul Kingsnorth represent the alternative. Well, that's not a false binary. <laughs> well, th- I mean, this is part of what convinces me that McGilchrist's work on the left brain and the right brain is so relevant to all of this, because mm. it gives us something stranger than a, a simple binary, because the simple binary is itself the way that the left brain is seeing the world. Mm. So you can arrive at something stranger out of recognising the element of truth in these binaries. And, you know, given the choice between viewing the world as a maths problem to be solved or having a metaphysical account of what kind of world we find ourselves in, I am definitely on Paul's side of that argument. Mm, Me too. (laughs) But I also want to challenge the monopoly on the numbers of those who claim that the world can be mapped and managed via spreadsheets. Like, I don't think that they have the monopoly on the mathematics. And I'm going to give you an example that I touch on in the book, which was written before Regenesis came out. So this isn't directly about the way George uses evidence, but it is about the context within which any of these arguments take place. So in 2009, there was this report from the ETC group ahead of the Copenhagen COP meeting called Who Will Feed Us? about the future of food in a climate-changed world. And among other things, they produced this startling figure that actually only 30% of the world's food is produced in the industrial food chain. 70% of the food that humanity eats comes from the peasant food web. It's being produced on small farms. Mm. It's being consumed by the people who grow it or traded locally or passing within the informal economy. Some of it is passing upwards into the mainstream economy. But basically, there's this huge amount of human subsistence that isn't the path that leads to the things we find on the supermarket shelves. And you know, the first time you hear that number, it's like, how can this be? Because yeah. our perception is so dominated by the industrial food chain. And the answer is partly because of the waste that George chronicles in the book, the amount of calories being used to feed animals, the amount of loss along the chain, the amount of waste that goes on in our kitchens, the whole relationship to food that supermarkets engender. Now, there's been a controversy about that 70% figure in recent years. And there have been two influential academic papers published which claim to debunk it. I'll put the links to all of this in the show notes. But basically, if you're going to go into the academic literature right now, you'll get a very different picture. You won't get a picture that says, you know, 70% of the food that humans eat today is being grown, produced within this peasant food web. However, there was an analysis last summer by researchers from A Growing Culture who look in detail at those two papers, and what they find is that the methodology is all wrong. They haven't actually debunked the original ETC group report and the 70% figure at all. They've just made a bunch of assumptions that allow them to present a very different picture. So, for example, one of the papers assumes that if large farms make up 80% of the agricultural land, then large farms must make up 80% of food production, (laughs) which is patently untrue. I can just well I can vouch for that just by looking at the size of my allotment relative to other plots <laughs> and how much food I produce compared to fellow allotment holders. Right, so you can actually literally apply common sense to yeah. call that into question. But at the moment, 
Because the analysis published last summer comes from an NGO publishing on Substack, it doesn't have the same status mm-hmm. as the peer-reviewed papers that it's critiquing. And the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization has shifted from using the 70% figure for how much of the world's food is produced by peasant farmers to 30% on the basis of those two papers. Now, again, mm. I'm not looking at the 2,000 papers that George tells us he's read in order to write Regenesis, but I am giving an example of how distorted or simply contested the maps of how the world is fed right now emerging from academic research can be. And I'd add that I think part of what's going on here has to do with the logic of progress, because mm. the people who publish academic papers overwhelmingly live, like you and me, in places where most of those around us are fed by the industrial food chain. So it's just kind of hard to believe what the ETC group is telling us about the reality of how the world is fed. And more than that, even when we notice that there are probably 2 billion people in the world right now who are part of small-scale farming households, looked at through the lens of progress, those people look like they're living in the past, like they're going away Mm. soon. While one Finnish startup promising to feed the world with yellow powder looks like the future. And so it is assumed that all those peasants are just going away. And that's something that's been being forecast for a really long time, you know, for generations. Mm, mm. And it still hasn't happened. So that's, you know, that's not me going directly at what George is saying in the book, but this is the larger context. And I talked about all of this with Vandana Shiva the other week in Stockholm and She's absolutely scathing about George, who she calls that boy, which reminded me of my (laughs) encounter with him in Tlangothlan, because frankly, you know, no one had said to me, are you chickening out since I was about 13? There is an Mm. element of getting stuck in the mentalities of adolescence that's there in the game, which George has been so good at playing and which we've often been grateful Mm. for him playing on our behalf as environmentalists. And I gather that Vandana has been picking up specifics in what George is saying on Twitter and arguing over the facts. But one of the points she made to me is you don't just read 2,000 papers. Those papers reach your desk and you ought to be curious about the process by which they get there. What shapes the institutional knowledge that's being produced? I, I don't know what I would add to that. I mean, I think, you know, the first time I came across that, that, that data... Uh, and that narrative around the you know the absolutely critical and ongoing role and contribution of small scale farmers uh, in terms of producing the food that most of the world eats, um, I was gobsmacked because it sat in very stark contrast to some of the um, corporate progressive narratives that I'd been fed um, and was digesting. So yes question your sources uh it's almost like a provenance um for want of a food related word um a provenance uh, of what we're actually consuming so here's the thing the conversation that i've had with a few people is this the problem is not that george has thrown his lot in with the eco-modernists who once upon a time he was a critic of Mm. and taken this extreme position on the future of agriculture The problem is that he's done this whilst continuing to occupy the position that he's occupied for decades as the one man human interface between the environmental movement and the mainstream media in Britain and to some extent beyond. Because I think the general feeling amongst the environmentalists that I speak to is whatever differences there have been in the past, Mm. the movement has felt represented by George on the whole in what he writes Whereas now we've reached a point where a lot of people are going to be reading George in The Guardian and assuming that he still represents a broad span of opinion within environmentalism, while actually many people within the environmental movement are alarmed by the positions he's advocating and no longer feel represented by him. And I have wondered aloud to you and various other people whether those who feel this way should come together and just write a letter to The Guardian saying this putting it on the record for the benefit of readers. I mentioned this to Vandana and her response was interesting. She said, I used to write a column for The Guardian back when they were interested in questioning globalisation. But the last time I was invited to their offices in London, I found that the floor where the people who write about agriculture sit is covered in Gates Foundation logos. Because you've got this sponsorship 
going on of The Guardian's coverage of various issues. And if you've been on the front line of the struggles that people like Van Dana have been on over decades with multinational corporations who want to own the very fabric of life, always in the name of feeding the world, then it seems naive, to say the least, to imagine that these powerful, well-meaning organisations founded by billionaires from the Davos set don't have written into their DNA the same approach to the world, Mm. the same blindnesses, and actually the same logic of exploitation and that through exploitation we make the world a better place, that is where all that money was made in the first place. Mm. Now, I said... I really don't think George would ever in a million years sell out to that multinational corporate agenda. And Vandana said, no, I'm not saying that at all. But if those are the surroundings you're operating in, if that's your reality, and if the sources of authoritative knowledge on which you go about writing your books and making your arguments about what should be done are coming from that context, then let's just say there's a risk there, okay? Again, I would not contest that at all. I think I was really struck in the last couple of weeks by all of the the chat, um, the literal chat around the AI uh, prose engine um, chat GPT, you know, this kind of Mm -hmm. all saying or oracle that you can now interrogate and come up with all sorts of different things. And it was Michael O'Callaghan of Global Vision who commented on this our critical thinking which is actually going to be so important and right now as we try and distinguish between these different paths that are in front of us relies on our innate ability to distinguish between knowledge and opinion um and, and with artificial intelligence that could go one of two ways either we have uh, you know a, a world of wild compelling and slightly convincing disinformation or we can find ways of unpicking the aggregation of opinion, which uh, reveal different and perhaps more compelling truths. And, you know, to bring us to a slightly playful um, end or towards a conclusion, a friend of mine, James, um, who works a lot on the use of artificial intelligence in Earth systems modelling, he uh, actually popped a question into chat gpt and invited it to write a, a poem on davos uh, in the style of dr zeus uh, which i will share with you now once upon a planet called ziggy there lived a race of cute fuzzy creatures oh so wiggly they had fur as soft as a cloud and they loved to sing loud but their planet was in trouble oh so dire the climate was changing the habitats on fire the seas were rising the air was hot but the zigs they just would not stop They blamed the weather on the moon, said it was changing much too soon. They blamed the heat on the sun, said it was having too much fun. They blamed the storms on the wind, said it was blowing out of its mind. They're not so good at rhyming, is it? Um, They blamed the drought on the rain, said it was falling down the drain. But the truth was plain to see the zigs were causing this catastrophe. Their factories and cars were to blame, but they couldn't see past their own fame. So they continued on their way, ignoring the warnings day by day, until one day it was too late, and the Ziggs had sealed their own fate. Their planet was a barren land, and the Ziggs they could not withstand, but they still sang and they still smiled, which I feel is like a kind of reference to Brecht that we've touched on before. They will be singing in the dark times. Um, Despite the fact their planet was defiled. Moral of the story, don't be like the Ziggs. Take care of your planet. Don't give it the jigs. Change your ways and make a stand, or you too may be a victim of your own hand. <laughs> well, gosh, what to say, Ed? I had to say it, actually, as, as a big fan of Dr. Zeus. ChatGPT's pastiche is slightly bringing out my inner Nick Cave. <laughs> yeah he, he's been quite spectacular hasn't he uh, he had a that. good old rant didn't he yeah <laughs> well you've got to, you've got to suffer to write like dr zeus <laughs> well, okay here's a place we could end things and end this series and bring things back around because there's a passage that i kept coming back to when i was writing at work in the ruins it comes from the anthropologists marisol de la cadena and mario blazer and they're writing about all of the talk about the Anthropocene it has been coming out of universities and cultural institutions, mm. all the books and conferences and exhibitions over the last decade or two. 
and how this kind of talk can sound from elsewhere. And they say it sounds a lot like the world of the powerful is becoming conscious of the plausibility of its own destruction. Having decreed the ending of so many other worlds on the way to the future in the name of the common goods of progress, civilization, development and liberal inclusion, suddenly it appears that our world too could end. And as I say in the book, two possibilities arise from this newfound sense of vulnerability. It can be a humbling moment in which, brought down to earth, we're able to hear at last what those on the receiving end of Western projects of colonization, salvation, modernization and development have been trying to tell us for generations. Or it can be the license for the grandest version yet of that project, an attempt to turn our planetary home and all those we share it with, our human kin and our more than human kith, into an object of global management and control, and all in the name of saving the world. Mm. Now, I believe that some of those pursuing this project are doing it with the best of intentions, genuinely and deeply convinced of the urgency of our predicament, convinced that the numbers say this is the only path that's left to take. But I also believe that it's a path to nowhere. And those of us who cannot be part of paving that path need to do what we can to bring into view the other possibilities that are hidden from view in the powerful stories its advocates are telling. Thank you for listening to this fourth series of The Great Humbling. Ed and I are really grateful for all the responses we've had from readers in the course of this series. All of you who've shared these episodes or written to us or talked about the podcast in social media. You can find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling. You can find Ed on Twitter as at Frucool. We'll be back later in 2023 with a fifth series. Meanwhile, if you want to follow the conversations further, go to homewardbound.org and sign up for my substack, Writing Home. At Work in the Ruins is out on 9th February in print and as an audiobook. And join me as I head out on tour to Frankfurt, Glasgow, Newcastle, Leeds, Sheffield, Dartington, Stroud, Norwich, Brighton and London in the weeks ahead. Full details at dougal.nu slash events. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 